at 7 o'clock. Sunday night, and you know what that means. It's Topical Starts right now. Very good evening to you, South Africa, those watching around the world. My name is Blaine Herman, and this is It's Topical, our digital audience with us tonight. It's good to see them. Looking forward to taking their questions for our guests in a short while. Two hours of uh, It's Topical tonight as we build up to President Cyril Ramaphosa's address at 8 p.m. He will be speaking to us about South Africa's foreign policy and the upcoming BRICS summit, so stay tuned for that. BRICS. Former chair of Goldman Sachs Asset Management International, Jim O'Neill, once commented, for South Africa to be treated as part of BRIC doesn't make any sense to me, he says. Remember, O'Neill uh, originally coined the acronym BRIC some 22 years ago. However, important to note, he later said, but South Africa as a representative of the African continent, well, that's a different story. Questions. What influence does South Africa have within a group like this but more importantly what are the tangible benefits for you and me the 2023 BRICS summit now on our doorstep the theme BRICS and Africa partnerships for mutually accelerated growth sustainable development and inclusive multilateralism I know sometimes we, we gloss over these themes right but I think this one is important we will discuss what about the the expansion of BRICS is it a case of a bigger the block more opportunities for global dialogue and developing emerging markets. We will break down that for you as well. Remember, around 40 heads of states, including UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, will attend. Monday night, China's president will land on our shores for his state visit. Significant, we will discuss. Which leads us to the question of the week. And we ask you, is BRICS membership good for South Africa's foreign policy? And is the public reaping the reward? Let us know at its topical SABC. Walk with me. Context coming up. I'll try my best to break down BRICS's identity for you. Also, what's, what's its role on the global stage? How can BRICS countries' shared values reshape the global architecture? We will discuss. Perspective coming up. let's get you context and as always we'll turn to the magic wall what we know and why it matters my guest tonight is SABC international news editor Sophie Mokwena she joins us now live Sophie good to have your better mind on the program tonight we need to break down this because people need to understand why they need to care about BRICS context always important history of BRICS and we know South Africa was the latest addition so these were the original founders, then the addition of uh, South Africa. Now there's talk of more, which will mean a second expansion. How possible is it and why is the sudden increase in interest in joining BRICS? I think it is possible. Perhaps they can look at BRICS plus, but then you have to deal with egos of countries mm, mm. because they will have a view that they want to be seen as part of this group and also you can't leave out the names of the country and these are some of the issues that the current leaders of BRICS will have to grapple with mm. but in terms of why the expansion the world is not the same mm. you have the multilateral institutions such as the United Nations mm -hmm. the World Bank the IMF yeah. You have that was launched or were launched after the Second World War. Right. At that time, how many countries were as big as they are today and mm -hmm. what were the geopolitics? You also have a situation, particularly during the pandemic, mm -hmm. where we saw the South South struggling or the developing South struggling to deal with the pandemic mm -hmm. while the developed North were just taking care of themselves yeah. and therefore then came the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Again, a clear indication that you need a multipolar world or 
a world where people yeah. can engage much better. And I think it is a scramble for platform yeah. where people can express their views because you have the G20. Yeah. Not everybody is in the G20, much as majority of the BRICS countries are members of the G20. You have the G7. Mm -hmm. And often these two powerful groups do decide Mm -hmm. in terms of the development yeah. of the globe. So this is what we're talking about in terms of the global numbers and the percentage. We can see that 42% of the world's population, that's the, the BRICS, 18% of global trade, 26 of the world's territory, 23% of the world's GDP. I wonder in terms of the interest that is now being shown in terms of joining this group from other countries, the tensions between China and the United States, perceived or otherwise, the Ukraine and Russia war, is that pushing countries to search for platforms like this? It does contribute, but the reality is, unfortunately, the, as we speak right now, the developing South mm -hmm. doesn't have a powerful voice and platform. Much as you have the South-South group, and Brazil is saying strengthen the South-South group, yeah. you still need another platform and i think BRICS can present that mm. platform not to compete mm. with mm. g20 not to compete with the g7 but provide an alternative a alternative platform yeah. to take forward the needs of the developing nations yeah. because south africa needs their partners in the west trading partners isn't it it's very important so this kind of narrative of BRICS being anti-west doesn't help south africa well, South Africa has made it clear that uh, BRICS, it's not all about anti-West, mm -hmm. nor fighting G20, of which we are a member of, and neither the G7, competition with the G7. It is just to ensure that you have more areas where you can engage in terms of the interest mm -hmm. of the country. Yes, of course, there's pressure, a huge pressure yeah. on South Africa particularly from the developed north yeah. because you know the tension between the developed north with countries such as Russia yeah. and China and therefore you will find that situation. It is therefore important for South Africa to be clear yeah. in terms of these relations and we know that mm. it is not the first time South Africa is involved in different forums and yes. different platforms to really put forward the voice of Africa, mm. not only the voice of the continent. And therefore, we have been able to manage mm. the West, the South, and all different uh, interest groups. Right. And we've had these relationships. And that is why I think tonight mm. the president is going to do just that, to say, this is our foreign policy. Yeah. We want friends. We don't want enemies, mm. be it in the North, South, East, West, or Central. Yeah. Look, some of the benefits. Let's talk about the BRICS Development Bank. I was in Shanghai in 2014 when it was announced that the headquarters are going to be uh, in, in, in that country, uh, in China. There was lots of optimism, lots of hope. Uh, has South Africa benefited from this bank? South Africa has. You know that uh, there are projects that uh, the bank is funding within the Development Bank. And therefore, South Africa is able to tap into those resources. I spoke to the vice president of the BRICS Bank, mm. uh, Leslie Mastop, two weeks ago. Mm. He pointed out that they are going to make announcements during this gathering where they are going to focus on energy. And you know very well South Africa is struggling. Mm. And particularly at the time where we are grappling with the uh, load shedding. He wow. also pointed out that they will be funding the infrastructure. Mm. So let's wait and see. We saw them going to the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Good results mm -hmm. there. And therefore, I think uh, there's a way in which South Africa can utilize mm. the BRICS Bank to address the challenges that we have, particularly the infrastructure, because right. without a good infrastructure, there's no way a country yeah. can develop. Have a look at this, the BRICS member states and the foreign currency reserves in the US dollar. Um, you see where South Africa ranks, you see where this important ally ranks. And the big thing is happening Tomorrow, uh, China's president landing at 11 p.m. The state visit then follows. Significant. 
very important. And I think these are the issues that President Ramaphosa will engage his counterpart from China, President Xi Jinping. You know, how do you balance the trade imbalance? And this message and their concern is not only in relation to government, but business as well. When I spoke to the BRICS Business Council, South Africa's BRICS Business Council, that's the main issue on their agenda this in, during this meeting, mm. to say, as South Africa, how do we ensure that there's a trade balance yeah. because many countries are benefiting the trade is skewed in favor of our counterparts right. within the BRICS nations now what how are we going to ensure that we do benefit it's not an easy thing i mm. mean it depends on the development often countries on the continent are complaining that uh, the trade imbalance is a problem yes. where South Africa trade is always skewed in favor of South Africa. Mm. So it does happen. It depends on right. development, the size of the GDP, the, yeah. you know, what you have as a country. But these issues must be right. tackled. What about these two countries here, powerful countries on the global stage? Um, but are they apparent fault lines within the alliance of BRICS? especially with these two countries? That's the main issue here. But you know that uh, some few weeks ago, there was a meeting of the security advisors mm. of the leaders of BRICS. Uh, those who are there are the people who advise their presidents, uh, prime minister, in terms of issues related to security yeah. and peace and security. And we saw on the margin of that meeting the representative of China and India mm -hmm. having a bilateral talk. I have no doubt, I have a strong view that they did touch on that tension. Mm -hmm. And now this meeting also presents a opportunity yeah. for China and India to engage on the margins of uh, BRICS. They've mm -hmm. done it in the, on the margins of uh, G20 previously. So with all those bilaterals, these are some of the issues. Right. I mean, the Niger question, yes. you can still look at that. The Secretary General coming, the Black Sea mm -hmm. uh, grain deal, you can engage with China and others who have influence on Russia. And yeah. therefore, it does also present an opportunity to deal with other issues, not necessarily issues that are related yeah. To the group but country to country and i'm sure the grain deal will be raised sharply at this meeting especially with the other african countries uh, attending because it has had a, a impact on them you know the secretary general's office when i spoke to them on friday they said his message the main message is the transformation of the multilateral institution he made a very strong statement mm. during the g7 in japan and he's carrying that message yes. again because he is dealing with all the challenges mm, that we yeah. are facing in the world, particularly after COVID-19 and now the war in Ukraine. And yeah. therefore, I expect a very fired up mm. Antonio Guterres. Right. Uh, Sophie, just before I let you go, and I know you're going to come back later on when you get reaction to, to the president's address uh, after 8 o'clock. But, you know, from talking to people, ordinary people on the ground, when, when we talk about BRICS, sometimes certain terms might fly over people's heads. Is there a fundamental understanding in terms of how BRICS can benefit us as ordinary citizens? You know, South Africans are fully involved in terms of what's happening in the country, on the continent and around the world. Yes, the concern is, are we going to benefit? Mm. That's the main question. But they are fully aware in terms of what's happening currently mm. globally. And they know very well that South Africa is not an island. Yeah. For South Africa pr to prosper, Africa must prosper, the world must prosper. Yeah. And therefore, yes, there are questions. And you know the challenges that we are facing as South Africa, as the region, as the continent. Mm -hmm. Issues of uh, unemployment, poverty, particularly after COVID-19 and yeah. the war in Ukraine. And therefore, people want to see tangible results. Right. And people, people are yearning for, you know, something that will inspire them. Mm -hmm. And I think these leaders, when they gather at the Sunshine Convention Center, they must take that into yeah. consideration that you have millions of South Africans who are struggling. Mm. You have a billion people on the continent 
who are looking at this summit. Mm. You have billions around the world yeah. who are watching. All eyes are on South Africa. Yeah. And it's our job, I guess, to break it down and make sense, give it context in terms of what humanity can expect from a, an organization like this. Sophie, thank you very much indeed. Sophie Mokona is SABC International News Editor. We're going to tap into a, a better mind a little later on as well. When the president speaks, we're going to get her take on it. Now to our regular feature, Word on the Street feature. We took to various areas across the country seeking diverse insights and perspectives on this topic. And this is what people had to say. Take a look. It'll be interesting to see what comes out from the BRICS conference, of course. Um, one, I'd love to get a sense of the development bank, how far that is, how much money has been spent, what kind of initiatives have been invested in, um, who the beneficiaries are. So that's a good place to start. And my expectation of um, this year's talks is that they actually speak about issues that have to do with the development of um, the countries involved. And um, I, I believe that one of the key issues that they should focus Focus on is the growth of the economy. You know, being part of BRICS is in general a good thing, but but the attitude towards an anti-American focus is just disastrous for South Africa. We can't afford that. Africa needs to be in an alliance with the United States, and and you know, BRICS unfortunately just seems to be pulling away any remnants of common sense. I think it will help developing countries like South Africa and other African countries. And um, yeah, we don't have to trade on the US dollar only. I think it depends on how, um, how it's expanded. So for example, what are the criteria? Are we looking to build, because these are alliances, are we looking to build alliances with countries that align with our values, our constitutional values in South Africa? And also, um, we'll bring growth to the country, economic growth and benefit. I'm hopeful that the BRICS will bring back the economies of the African countries to stability. We should have more jobs. Our health system should be up to scratch. And we shouldn't be wandering around as to where to go because of we are resourcing the East and the West whilst Africa remains impoverished. South Africa needs in the short term to be careful about its relationship with uh, Russia as a member of BRICS. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. And, and secondly, and possibly less politically focused, uh, it needs to make sure that it optimizes the benefit um, from BRICS from a trade and health and education perspective. All right, sentiment on the ground. No doubt we'll get more uh, reaction to President Cyril Ramaphosa's address. Eight o'clock, we have uh, my colleague Mark Ketlamotlabe out and about. He's going to be live in Santon. So we're going to get you uh, real time reaction to the president's speech. Now, let's take it to the next level. Let's break it down brick by brick, as they say. Uh, an enlarged BRICS grouping, does it align with South Africa's? foreign policy. Dr. Nale Dipando is here with us. Minister, mm -hmm. thank you very much indeed. Yaki Salias, doctor, thank you very much indeed for your time. We also have our digital audience here. They'll pop up soon and they will be throwing, obviously, questions to our guests. Thank you very much once again. Uh, to you, Minister, first. And tonight's program is all about, you know, mm -hmm. breaking it down and understanding BRICS and its <coughs> benefits. Uh, to answer the question that many have, why should I care? Um, how would you describe BRICS's identity and, and its role in the global stage? Well, I think that uh, BRICS is essentially a forum of uh, countries uh, of the South or that identify themselves as countries of the South. And often this is a reference to uh, developing countries. What makes it, uh, I think, an interesting forum is the uh, presence of India and China within that grouping. These are very large countries with significant number in terms of population, mm -hmm. as well as uh, countries that have really made strides in terms of development in the mm -hmm. last 20 years. So it brings together countries that see themselves as progressive, mm -hmm. uh, as committed to democracy, and also focused mm -hmm. on pursuing the agenda of development for their people. Right. So, obviously the West, as a trading partner, is very important to South <coughs> Absolutely. Africa. Absolutely. So how would you react to the narrative that is being put out there that BRICS is anti-West? Well, I think it's very, very wrong. Um, 
there are many, many fora uh, that exist all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, you've had the Indo-Pacific mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alliance, which the United States uh, is part of. We mm -hmm. don't see it as hostile to us. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the Quad, where Australia, China, uh, the UK come together, yeah. the, the United States. So I think, sorry, not China, actually, USA, uh, UK, yes. uh, <laughs> Australia, and the fourth of the quad, I can't remember, but uh, that we don't see it, mm -hmm. Canada, as hostile to us. Mm -hmm. These are formations of uh, countries that have shared interests in particular areas. We mm -hmm. have Iora where countries that border the Indian Ocean mm. uh, come together to discuss uh, development and how we work to ensure that the, P, uh, the sea supports us in our commitment right. to economic development through the ocean economy, but also through ensuring uh, that the opportunity uh, uh, to use the ocean yeah. is devoted toward peace and development right. and not conflict. Right. So there are many, many reasons uh, for which countries come together. And I think it's very important that we always say to uh, the people of South Africa that nations in diplomacy have a range mm. of diplomatic uh, uh, links, of friendships essentially, uh, that are uh, you know, enjoined for a range of purposes. Yeah. Uh, at times they may not be material or evidently material, uh, but when that contract is signed, as was just last week, yeah. for reopening of beef exports to China, this is a very important uh, a step forward. Mm -hmm. All the one pending on avocados to a very large uh, economy. So I think uh, it might be that people are not you know, in step with the positives, the developments, the outcomes. But these are friendships. Mm -hmm. There are partnerships, their right. relations uh, that we are building and right. they should be built to a good purpose mm -hmm. with all uh, countries of the world. Right. Let's take it, well, Dr. Silias, this year's BRICS Summit has a very African feel to it, which I guess is a good thing from your perspective because I remember reading uh, a report that the ISS uh, put out, I think it was in 2017, which talks about the importance of strengthening our relationships with African countries, the mm -hmm. regional. Uh, how does that focus on our neighbors uh, and the continent uh, balance when we put ourselves within BRICS? So South Africa at the moment is the only uh, African member on BRICS. Mm. South Africa has been an advocate of expanding BRICS, particularly bringing other African countries in. A number of countries, Egypt and others, have uh, apparently um, requested to join BRICS. Mm -hmm. But um, South Africa has made its position within BRICS very clear that it, you know, not acting on behalf of Africa, mm. but represents Africa. Our challenges in this regard are that on the one side, um, South Africa is supposed to be driving development in Africa. And um, China is our major trading partner, but also our major competitor mm -hmm. uh, in, mm -hmm. in Africa. And that we, you know, exporting increasingly commodities to China, we should be going up the value, mm -hmm. uh, value curve. So it's a complicated relationship. Um, it's important, I think, that Africa as 54 or 55 members of the um, UN General Assembly play a more important role globally um, and uh, that uh, BRICS, as the minister said, is one of a number of clubs. BRICS mm -hmm. is not an economic, um, there's no economic uh, uh, cohesion within it. Right. Uh, in terms of it's not like the European Union, uh, it even has less of a value convergence mm -hmm. than, than the G7. But it is a club that represents sort of the global south. It can uh, help to unlock some of the challenges that face uh, the world, uh, mm -hmm. the dominance of the US dollar, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, and a more balanced global economy in terms also of terms of political representation within the yeah. G20, the UN Security Council. So, and what BRICS has done for South Africa is it, it has elevated South Africa, a relatively small economy, mm -hmm. To a global stage, mm. right, and that is quite uh, amazing when mm. you uh, you know look at our relative 
a relative position in the global pecking order. So yeah. from a South African perspective, BRICS is very important. Yeah. So, Minister, when you hear of talk such as de-dollarization, mm. um, how does it rank within terms of the context that will be discussed at this summit? Or is it more of, you know, deepening interactions within local currency? Is, is that where the conversation is heading? The key issue uh, that has been discussed is greater use of local mm. currencies for international trade. Uh, so we've been uh, uh, less uh, interested in, you know, discussing not using the dollar. We don't think yeah. that that is, a, you know, a discussion we should be having at this time. Mm. But reducing uh, its dominance in all uh, uh, trade matters and it being, you know, of such force and effect that once there's a sanction mm -hmm. unilaterally imposed, all of us uh, are affected. And we need to find a model mm -hmm. that l allows less economic harm, particularly to more fragile uh, economies. And if we can develop a model uh, of a payment system internationally that allows for what is being talked about, yeah. the use of a variety of currencies, uh, this may begin to move us toward a more mm -hmm. Uh, equitable uh, position. Right. In, in terms of the expansion, uh, would you say there's convergence in terms of criteria and procedure uh, as we about to get into the summit this week? Finally, yes, I think we, we have uh, reached a, a point uh, of agreement. Uh, we have a document mm -hmm. that uh, our leaders now uh, uh, would be looking at and they'll be able to guide uh, following their discussions uh, this coming week. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had you know, extensive discussions as foreign ministers. Our Sherpas mm -hmm. uh, have also had uh, very, very concentrated hours. Mm -hmm. And I think we've refined the guidelines and identified the core values uh, that we believe should be associated uh, with any expansion right. uh, of, of BRICS. Uh, Dr. Siliers, when the minister talks about core values, um, which sort of countries can jump or springs to mind? Uh, we saw reports of interest from Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, mm -hmm. Iran. Uh, what sort of benefit would these countries have in terms of BRICS? Well, um, those countries that you've mentioned are all um, large uh, oil gas exporters and their inclusion in BRICS will elevate the nature of BRICS in the sense that um, the entire oil and gas uh, market is managed in US dollars. And um, once that shifts, it will, and shifts to within a non-US context, mm. because the US is basically energy self-sufficient. It no longer needs the oil and the gas that it used to get from the Middle East. It has quite an impact on the global balance of power and, and shifts. And the Middle East in particular is emerging as another center of power in this more complicated world that we are headed for. Mm -hmm. I think the minister put it very well that I use the term de-dollarization mm -hmm. and that's a bit of a red flag. And, and I think that the issue really is a more equitable use of different currencies because it's, it's not going to be possible to step away from the dollar. Right. What is possible is that, and this is already happening, that China, Russia, uh, India and everybody starts trading more in their own currencies. So when the US Reserve, uh, Federal Reserve increases their interest mm -hmm. rates, as it does, then the South African rand doesn't fall, right. mm -hmm. uh, fall, uh, fall down. So these kind of eff effects that the dominance of the, US, of the dollar has mm -hmm. on economies th that are not affected by that, um, should not be affected by these kind of effects, are very important. Yeah. Particularly for South Africa, we can see how the South Africa, the value of the South African rand, is determined by what happens uh, with uh, in the U.S. economy, right. and that's not healthy for South Africa. Yeah. We need to take a quick break. Uh, we are asking you basically the question: Is what do you make of South Africa's interactions among BRICS countries as well as other African countries as well? Does it fall part, an important part, of South Africa's foreign policy? Are you reaping the rewards as a citizen? We're going to come back and ask the minister as well as Dr. Salias as well to break it down, give us practical examples of how you and I can benefit from this global formation called BRICS. More next. Welcome back. You're watching It's Topical. And the question we ask you this week is, is BRICS membership good 
for South Africa's foreign policy and is the public reaping the rewards? Uh, we're trying to break down BRICS identity as well as global role. How can BRICS countries' shared values reshape the global architecture? Let's discuss with our guests, uh, Dr. Naledi Pando, Minister, as well as uh, Dr. Yaki Saliers. Um, Minister, with regards to other multilateral platforms, mm. is BRICS reaching or looking at other formations in order to draw best practice? Well, um, we are part of, of many other uh, formations. Uh, we're part of G20, mm. uh, for example, as uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So we sit there together and often we would bring the perspectives that emanate from BRICS into mm. uh, that forum. And I think our presence in G20 has been uh, quite important in this period of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, right. uh, because there's almost been a temptation to make G20 a security organ focused on matters of conflict rather than its original establishment, which was a focus on issues of economy mm. and particularly economic development with the South coming together with G20 uh, mm. members. So I think the BRICS presence there has been very useful to kind of bring us back to the key yeah. uh, issues for which uh, G20 right. uh, exists. Um, I, I would want to just say that uh, we should also recall that while we have BRICS, South Africa also has bilateral relations with each of the uh, uh, member, uh, members of the forum. And uh, we advance the interests of South mm -hmm. Africa at that bilateral level. So you wouldn't, within the BRICS right. meetings, be discussing the fact that Brazil put a particular tariff on chicken thighs or mm, something. Mm, but mm. in the bilateral with Brazil, we would pursue that. So um, I do want to say to the public that we should understand there may be different topical issues yeah. uh, that we would discuss in the BRICS context, and it may very well be much more the global issues, mm, mm. whereas in the bilateral partnerships, we may very well come down to the key yeah. uh, aspects that affect us as uh, the yeah. two uh, countries. I also finally want to say that we in BRICS, the one shared aspect we have is belief that we don't displace the United Nations. It's the right. premier multilateral institution mm -hmm. in the view of all the BRICS members. Right. We do believe there should be reform, right. but the UN exists as the premier mm -hmm. global body. Let's talk about, just help us pull back the curtain a bit um, in terms of those bilaterals that you were talking about. How healthy is the relationship between the, the, the five countries, especially that of India and China? Well, you would know better than I do that, uh, that there are tensions uh, uh, related to the border uh, uh, area between the Catch two me. countries, and there have been some, uh, uh, you know, firing of shots across from both countries. We're hoping uh, that we will get to a situation in which the two mm -hmm. could resolve uh, this particular challenge because it does, you know, tend to influence mm -hmm. the nature of the discourse. And so it is a concern uh, for our leaders, and I'm sure uh, our presidents, when they meet on their own in yeah. the retreat, would probably have some brief discussion on this. But we are careful not to become immersed in a bilateral mm. uh, a matter because that could detract from what the uh, five can do together. Right. Uh, Dr. Saliers, just before we go into our digital audience and get their comments, how would you elaborate or describe the benefits of BRICS to somebody sitting, for, for instance, my granny who's sitting at home now watching and saying, why should I care? I mean, wh how is this going to affect me and my family? How would you explain that? Well we are all South Africans, we're all interested in growth, we're all interested in development and uh, BRICS certainly provides South Africa with opportunity. Um, China is our largest trading partner. India is the next country that is going to uh, import commodities and uh, all kinds of goodies from Africa. So we are in a partnership with uh, two of the global emerging economies while the whole world's economy is moving eastward. 
Uh, the, that's where growth is going to come from. So you can tell your granny mm -hmm. that um, this has benefits. Mm -hmm. Our major area of engagement is Africa. It's the area where we have competitive advantage mm -hmm. and we need to lever bricks, if I can mm -hmm. put it that way, to help us and to help Africa. And there I think uh, South Africa can do more than it's, uh, than it's done at the moment. Right. And that is to use BRICS and really to do our own Belt and Road infrastructure right. into Africa. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as Africa rises, it will pull South Africa with it. Mm -hmm. and this is our major issue that we need to, to get going. Right. Let's take it to our digital audience now. I'm sure they have a lot of burning questions uh, as we endeavor to try and break down what BRICS is all about. Uh, Kustas, you have your hand up. Let's unmute. Let's get your take. All right. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for, for the great conversation. My question to, to your panel is this. Uh, considering that the Development Bank has just raised bonds in RANs, mm. is there a consideration where the BRIC nations can trade amongst each other in a local currency? Because from what I'm seeing here, they've got a huge amount of dollars um, that they have in their foreign reserves. At what point are they going to increase the reserves of the rand, rupee, yuan, and take your pick? Mm. Thank you. Kustas, thanks. So let, me, let me put it to you, Minister. Mm. Uh, the idea of the creation of this group's own currency? Well, I think uh, rather than own currencies, trading in our own currencies, that certainly uh, is part of what we're planning. And uh, I think with the issuing of the uh, bond in rands, and the take up of over a billion uh, mm. uh, is certainly an indication of interest. Mm. So uh, this is perhaps the first uh, shot, but of course we had the rupee yes. uh, uh, trading uh, with Russia in a special arrangement on the purchase of oil uh, uh, from Russia. So this is uh, the, at the heart of the discussions about really looking at changing mm. the financial uh, trading system to be far more diverse and inclusive. Right. And President Dilma Rousseff, the president of the New Development Bank, has indicated that this is one of the most important items on her agenda mm. for this coming year. Mm. Dr. Silias, uh, a step in the right direction in terms of the benefits? Yes, um, I, uh, it's not possible to, for the BRICS to put together a common currency. Mm. We don't have a central bank. Mm. We so on and so forth. Um, look at the, even the European Union, how that struggles. So trading in individual currencies, I think that's already happened. Almost each of, the, of these countries, except for South Africa, has established uh, its own version of uh, sort of uh, payment systems. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really an important step. We, we need to get towards a, a more balanced system than a system that, um, as we said previously, that what happens uh, with the Treasury in the US actually affects all of us. Right. So I think it's, it's really an important development. Um, the transition is bound to be a little bit rocky and mm -hmm. a little bit difficult, but already we see significant volumes of trade between these countries that are being done in their individual currencies. Yeah. All right, let's take it back to our digital audience. Let's go to Neo and then Eddie. Neo, to you first. All right, good evening and good evening to the panel and the viewers. Uh, well, before I actually give my question, I'd like to actually just say that to Dr. Naledi Panda, she's played an important role, particularly when it comes to you know, defending the sovereignty of South Africa. So I'd like to you know, commend her on that and for the job that she's done so well up to this point. My question would be, yes, we are going to receive the idea of where BRICS goes, as all the countries, but in South Africa, how is, is there a plan in educating the youth, the masses, mm -hmm. and the vision going forward? All right, thank you, Neil. Uh, let's hear from Eddie uh, and the knowledge before we get some responses. I, good evening, everybody. I just need to uh, uh, pose a question to the minister. Uh, I saw they under the benefits that they will put all these uh, catalytic uh, sectors and collab uh, collaborate with them. So I just need to find out from the minister, how are they going to collaborate with them? And uh, how will, you know, if, if she can explain in detail that we can understand uh, just a bit to articulate into it, 
how it's going to work. Mm. Thank you. All right, Eddie, thank you very much indeed. Knowledge to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to start by saying uh, that BRICS is a, a very good platform for South Africa and for Africa at large. Because uh, in the past, before there was BRICS, we used to be bullied by the West, the G20, the G7, such that if you don't obey whatever they tell you, you get forced or you, you get told that uh, will cancel AGOA, will do this. So I think BRICS is a, a good opportunity for us as uh, Africans to negotiate so that we can get a good deal. So I would like to really commend uh, South Africa and especially our minister, Dr. Naled Dupan, mm. she has been uh, representing us well there. So I feel like we must uh, proceed with the BRICS if it goes even to the point of having a currency. Mm. We must go that far. Though we must not take it as if uh, it, it, it is a challenge right. against the West. We must benefit from both relationships. All right, Dolly, thank you very much indeed. Let's get some responses to you, Minister. First, uh, Neo's point about the importance of educating, especially mm. the youth, about BRICS and why it matters. Mm. This is uh, something that we, you know, agree is very, very important. That's why in our chairship, uh, we've seen the establishment of a youth forum, mm -hmm. which will, for the first time, report to the BRICS leaders on uh, the various meetings that they've held and all countries had young people represented mm. uh, in in the forum so uh, we're really thrilled uh, that young people have taken such an interest mm -hmm. we had a number of outreach uh, initiatives led by the deputy ministers mm -hmm. in Durk, mm -hmm. and they went to different parts of the country meeting uh, young people and explaining to them bricks and the programs yep. that you know, reside within the BRICS uh, rubric. Uh, so we certainly have a vibrant uh, youth interest and a growing uh, set of activities yeah. among young people. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add something to this? Because I, what worries me quite a bit when I look at the public discussions mm. on this in South Africa is the very sharp divisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are a divided country, uh, particularly in the business community versus government and also sometimes in certain sectors. I think a lot of education needs to, and outreach needs to happen, particularly to the business community, because the, the public discourse is that um, BRICS versus the West, mm. BRICS versus the G7, right. and that South Africa has made a choice, uh, and the kind of nuance and the benefits that we can gain from both, and the complexity of international relations is certainly not understood by mm. particularly the, the business sector. So I, I really think that there's a lot of work that lies right. ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister, to Eddie's question uh, around collaboration and the benefits thereof, if you can explain that. Well, certainly, uh, I think that was a really good question. Uh, one of the things uh, we've agreed upon is to collaborate in our responses to the effects of climate change. Mm. And a key sector that we've uh, chosen is energy, and particularly the notion of the just energy transition. Uh, we're finding, for example, that we are a, getting a great deal of technology transfer mm -hmm. from a country such as China to assist us with immediate responses to the electricity inadequacy that South Africa has been confronted mm -hmm. with. And we're working closely with Brazil on green uh, economy and uh, green energy technologies. So we draw on each other's strengths to establish uh, collaborative partnerships. But the beginning, the procurement must be in South Africa. Right. And what we are really working toward are partnerships with entities in the BRICS uh, uh, member states so that we draw on experience and skills mm. that they have and build the growth in enterprises in uh, South Africa. Right. Right, we did ask our viewers to send us their video as well as audio messages relating to the topic, the importance of BRICS and how it impacts you. Uh, you have sent in your messages. Let's take a listen. 
issue of bricks, Proverbs 12 and 24 says, when counselors increase, the plans and purposes are established and there is safety. So there will be safety between the countries that are running bricks, so less war, and our economies will be strong. The day the dollar die, things are going to be so much better, said Peter Tosh. Expanding of BRICS would be a good thing for South Africa, as it would mean new trade partners, new investors to invest in South Africa, as we know that South Africa needs people to invest in it. But expanding of BRICS would also mean South Africa would lose its influence, as it, it is the weakest link in all of the countries that are in it right now. My views on the BRICS summit, it's well, um, it's long overdue. We need something like that, and we need a backup of uh, Putin's caliber, where they put their own citizens before any other thing, unlike our own presidents and people of South Africa who are putting outsiders first, and then the citizens come after. All right, so we appreciate your comments. Uh, Dr. Celia, as to the issue of the expansion, would you say, to what extent would you say, is there security in numbers? I think the expansion of BRICS is important. Uh, in one sense, uh, the only way in which we are going to restructure the global financial and security architecture, including the UN, is through pressure. Mm. I'm afraid if we look to the West, um, to do this on their own, they will not. Um, and BRICS represents a very important pressure group. And it's important that we reform the global system and not try and uh, create a new one or to break it down and think that we can establish a different system. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, BRICS is a very important pressure group. Mm -hmm. And it's important that BRICS not be seen as some kind of a ganging up against the West. We have to find, possibly within the context of an expanded G20, a place where these groupings also come together mm. uh, beyond the General Assembly and the other fora. Because we, we have very divergent views in the world and there are very divergent views and values within BRICS. Mm. And this is something that will eventually also come to the fore because BRICS is not, um, doesn't have a set of common values to the extent that, for example, the G7 has and that will play itself out. Yes. But in the meanwhile, I think uh, BRICS uh, reflects the urgency of global reform. Mm -hmm. You know, something like 21 African countries at the moment are facing debt distress. Um, Africa needs two, three times the debt yeah. that we have at the moment. We can't afford it because of the interest rates that we pay and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. There are many factors that can have an Im a positive impact that can be engineered through BRICS. So I think that generally it uh, reflects a more yeah. complicated, diverse world right. and uh, that journey has started. I wonder, Minister, how can BRICS practically put pressure to change the dynamic? Well, I think uh, we, we have to agree in international fora uh, what our approach will be to a particular issue. On the matter of UN reform, uh, we have had different perspectives coming from uh, different regions of the world. But in BRICS, we've agreed that we support UN reform mm -hmm. and we would like to have a more detailed discussion on what we should insert into what we believe as South Africa mm -hmm. should be text-based negotiations. We've been talking about reform for so long, but we haven't actually made concrete uh, proposals. Yeah. We also are clear in BRICS uh, even Russia, which is a member of the Security Council, agrees on this one. Mm -hmm. That we're not talking about more powerful countries being in the Security Council. We're talking about the excluded. Mm -hmm. We're talking about democratization. We're speaking of representativity. And I think these important shared principles are key as uh, we enter uh, more deliberate discussions on UN reform, which yeah. have been I think dynamized by what has occurred mm. uh, between Russia and, and Ukraine. Right. Let's take it back to our digital audience now. I uh, also want to, if yes. you would allow me, to Go say on. to knowledge yes. that uh, it's really important that we don't see BRICS in opposition yeah. to something, as uh, Dr. Celia said. It's a progressive uh, forum representing the voice of developing countries. Mm. We'd like it to be a strong voice, but for South Africa, Trade with the United States of America is important. Trade with Western Europe is important. 
as is trade with China, mm. with India, with Brazil. So what we are looking for is to advance the interests of South Africa yeah. and not to make an enemy out of anyone. But we want to stand mm. for what we believe right. in. And we want to be the ones who determine the nature of that stand. And to Knowledge's point, this platform for South Africa per se, how much of a platform is it for, for South Africa to not only have bark but also have bite? Absolutely imperative. I mm. mean, when you have that level of support of these major developing mm. uh, uh, countries and China being the second largest economy in the world, mm. these are critical friends yeah. uh, to have. And I think we should not undermine uh, that relationship. Right. I want to talk to you a little bit more about uh, China's uh, the state visit happening uh, on, on Tuesday. Uh, China's president is landing tomorrow, I understand, mm -hmm. at 11 o'clock. But let's take it uh, to our digital audience. We'll come back to that. Uh, Zipa Zonke, to you. If you can unmute, uh, Zipa. There we go. Good evening, good evening um, to you and yours, and good evening to the panelists. Um, I think I just want to, I don't want to put a dampen on everything, but I feel like a, a, a lot of the language that we use when we talk about breaks is more from a weaponization against um, the waste, so to speak. And I think if we just look at the two main um, reasons as to why you would join a block such as BRICS is for economic reasons and security reasons. Um, so from a purely economical point of view, I mean, you look at China, they use BRICS, uh, they in the BRICS block, but their biggest trade partner is the United States of America, who's not in BRICS. Um, you look at um, the top 10 trade partners for China, only one country in BRICS, which is in there, appears in the top, in the top 10 of countries in which they trade with. So clearly, in the China's point of view, they're not weaponizing, uh, they're not using BRICS to weaponize against the West. So I think that's a cautionary uh, tale and, mm. and list that South Africans can use and say, how do we use this uh, BRICS as a protection to then go for our own interests as a country? Mm. Uh, from a security point of view, are we trying to get onto the United Nations Com uh, Security Council? Are we going to use BRICS to get there or are we just happy to say Russia's going to fight our battle? From an economic point of view, no one is talking about any technological policy. I mean, the world, if you look at social media, it's mm. going in a technological direction. Ukraine, Russia, war. Yes, a lot of it has got man to man combat, but a lot of it has got to do with drones and technology and things like that. So, what are the policies in South Africa? Maybe the minister can answer this for me. What, what is South Africa saying? Okay, we're going to use bricks to then allow ourselves as South Africa to stand on our own two feet. Because I looked at your stats earlier, you said, that um, it showed all the four other four countries' GDP was in the trillions, except for South Africa. Mm. Basically, our S on BRICS is a small S, and the rest of the company, countries are capital S. Right. That's a problem. All right, Zippo, thanks. Thank you very much. I think we got the gist. Your line is not too good. But, uh, Minister, with regards to not weaponizing BRICS, but rather using it uh, or capitalizing on the benefits of BRICS, how best can mm. we do that? Well, I don't think anybody uh, in government has ever said we want to weaponize BRICS. This is in the imagination of some in the media and perhaps some uh, in the public. I have always stressed since I came into this office that all trade partners are important. All relationships are important. But what I also resist is being bullied by anybody because uh, I think South Africa can stand for its ideals and national interest. Mm. Um, so there's no weaponizing, but there is the utilization mm. of an important forum to advance our shared interests and South Africa's own uh, national interests. Because what the forum does, it creates an opportunity for us to be far closer yeah. to India and China mm. than we might be if we were just relating in G20 or some other forum. Yeah. Here, it's just the five together. You have very intimate deliberations about key issues of development, and you advance the programs of South Africa right. in such deliberations. We do so uh, within the AGOA Forum mm. uh, with the United States of America. We do so in the Commonwealth with the United Kingdom. So uh, South Africa's whole approach of foreign policy is to work with the world mm -hmm. and not to be an enemy 
of others. We've had enough of that. We had right. oppression. We had the struggle against apartheid. We, we had quite enough of enemies. Mm. Mm. And we've built the foundation of our democracy. It's on peace and security and friendship. Right. Uh, speaking about AGOA, what, would you say South Africa's position within AGOA is safe? I'm certainly hopeful that it is. Uh, I'll be, we'll know in 2025 mm -hmm. uh, when Congress deals with the matter. Uh, but we've done a lot of work on the ground to ensure uh, that we continue to maintain good relations. Yeah. We will be hosting the forum uh, later this year. Uh, the noises and in, uh, interventions we're having from friends are very positive so yeah. i'm i'm optimistic all right uh, just a reminder to our viewers we are keeping a close eye on the union buildings president Sol Maposa will address the nation at eight o'clock we understand remember he's going to talk about south africa's foreign policy as well as BRICS. important conversation to have we're going to take you there live as soon as that happens uh dr salias your your take with regards to the issue of weaponization as opposed to using to capitalize on BRICS as a platform no i think uh, i think the the weaponization story one certainly needs to uh, to avoid and I mean South Africa is a very small s at the end of the mm. BRICS um, compared to, to China and, and so on so uh, we can't instrumentalize BRICS I think our problem and it came to the fore particularly around Russia is that uh, we were being instrumentalized by mm. by Russia in particular mm. and I think that cost us a tremendous amount of international goodwill and all kinds of problems around the announcement of what happened to the Lady R and so right. on so I, um, yeah, I think we, we, we need to balance the relationship and to extract from the relationship the maximum benefit that we can. Uh, the ministers mentioned some of them reform and global mm. positions. We've talked about uh, how to restructure the global system, that it is a more equitable system that provides space for Africa and South Africa's development. Mm. And South Africa faces many challenges. Um, uh, so BRICS is important. It's not the only game, uh, not the only party mm -hmm. in town. But yeah. uh, it's, it's important for South Africa. Uh, Minister, speaking about Lady R, um, we await the report, the mm -hmm. final report. But, mm. uh, you know, from, from what you've gathered over the past couple of months, the U.S. ambassador to South Africa's utterances, how do you think that was handled? Well, on the part of the ambassador, I thought rather badly. Uh, on our part, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the report. I uh, have a great deal of faith in uh, South Africa's uh, legal framework for the sale of arms in that it's extremely strict in fact from conversations with my other ministerial colleagues in different parts of the world we have one of the strictest regimes mm. in terms of sale of arms and even our defense industry yeah. complains about <coughs> what we require so I'm keen to know, did anyone escape that net? Mm. And if they didn't, I hope we're going to get an apology. Right. Uh, is there any action or steps uh, that's going to be taken from the South African point of view, South African government point of view, against the U.S. ambassador to South Africa? Well, I think let's, let's wait and see what the report says. Uh, but as I said, uh, I'm much more about friendship. Mm. I'm much more about advancing the interests of South Africa. So whatever action we take, must be directed toward that. Right. Let's take it back to our digital audience. Tina Bella, you have your hand up. If you can unmute your question, comment. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and also, good evening to Minister Pandor and Dr. Salia and the panel and everybody for addressing, thanking, the, taking the time to address our questions. Um, I'm not a BRICS expert, but I have two concerns and I would like to, it's, a, it's actually two-part question if you can indulge i just want to get there um the first one is uh uh, uh minister Pando, according to our foreign policy the durko overall mandate is to work for the realization of south africa's foreign policy objectives please maybe ask the chair explain to us how the following objective and i quote protecting south africa's sovereignty and territorial integrity will be achieved if we stand the risk of the domestic economy of south africa being and um, allow me further eroded than what it is mm. and then secondly on that note um there's another concern South Africa's foreign policy focuses on building unity 
inclusive economic development and shared prosperity for the African continent and its people. Yeah. Now, my question there is why then, if we are aiming for the aforementioned, mm. do we collaborate with countries who might have ulterior motives? All right, Tina, thank you very much indeed. You line not too good there. But with regards to South Africa's foreign policy, I know the president is probably going to touch on this in a short while. By the way, we keep a close eye on that when the president takes to the lectern, we'll take you there uh, live. But uh, uh, your understanding in terms of Tina's question and... Uh, South Africa's, you know, associating with certain countries that might be problematic. Well, <laughs> uh, which countries are not problematic? You know, I, I don't know which angels uh, we're creating uh, in this discussion. Uh, but we should not forget Syria, Iraq, mm -hmm. Palestine, uh, and many, many countries uh, in the world uh, that are suffering great harm through the actions of great powers, Afghanistan and so on. Mm -hmm. So let's not sanitize one part of the world and make evil another. Mm. All have fault lines and uh, we have to navigate all of this as uh, South Africa and ensure that we do so in the best way possible through our foreign policy mm. uh, and practice but also ensure that those objectives of development that we have are being addressed. I would cite job creation one of the largest investors in South Africa more recently through the investment conferences hosted by President Ramaphosa mm -hmm. has been China with establishing real enterprises yeah. that are productive in South Africa, especially in the automotive and technology sectors. Similarly, we've seen investment by India yeah. in a range of sectors. So uh, just as we have with the United States, with Europe, so, you know, I don't say, oh, the angel is that yeah. one and the devil is this. Mm -hmm. It's what do we wish to pursue? Are we succeeding? One of our biggest concerns for many, many months has been China not purchasing our beef. Mm -hmm. Our farmers were losing out. And that was due to uh, uh, the disease that we had, uh, uh, which, you know, Minister Didiza really dealt with very, very effectively. Mm -hmm. And just this week, We've had confirmation China is reopening, uh, you know, to uh, imports from yeah. South Africa of beef. This is big for farmers in that sector. Yeah. So um, just as Europe buys our beef, just as we export our citrus uh, uh, to various parts of the world. So let's look at the whole picture. Nobody is this brilliantly good mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this one so terribly bad. That's not how you conduct. What you want to avoid is harm from any of them. Right. Um, I just want to welcome, it's just gone 8 o'clock, I just want to welcome our viewers as well, those that are joining from DTT. This is, it's topical. My name is Blaine Herman. Uh, the extended version uh, tonight, we're going on until 9 o'clock. Our digital audience with us tonight as well. Also, my guest, Dr. Naledi Pando, Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, as well as Dr. Yaki Salias, a political scientist and founder of the Institute for Security Studies. Two hours of its topical tonight as we build up. Uh, to President Cyril Ramaphosa's address uh, was scheduled for 8 p.m. We will take you there live as soon as he gets to the lectern. He's speaking to us about South Africa's foreign policy and the upcoming BRICS summit. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Dr. Silias, before I go to our digital audience, with regards to the expansion um, of BRICS, what sort of measures needs to be put in place in order for this expansion not to cause any conflict? Mm around the world? I guess um, you have to look at who, who applied. The minister has spoken mm -hmm. about a, a document that they've prepared so she would know I don't. But um, I think uh, the expansion needs to be balanced. Um, it depends if you uh, take a certain grouping of countries uh, that are hostile towards the West, in, for example, mm. you'd create a problem. Mm. So it has to be balanced. It has to, uh, there has to be a degree of uh, a regional leadership, I assume, and a variety of other criteria that I assume that um, Durko and uh, that the BRICS uh, Sherpas have worked through. But I think that issue of, of, of balance mm. uh, is probably going to be the most important. Mm. I don't know whether we're going to see announcement of new members. I think we probably will see announcement of some criteria mm -hmm. and then moving forward. But certainly there are a number of countries that have indicated they want to join, including from Africa, countries like Egypt. Um, and so we'll see mm. uh, Ethiopia, I understand Algeria. as well. Mm -hmm. Nigeria. Algeria. Yeah. Algeria. 
Algeria. Mm. Mm. Yeah, are, are, Algeria. Are, we, are we likely to get an announcement at the summit, Minister, with regard to the new members? Well, I, I want to leave that to the president. <laughs> I, I don't wish to, you know, right. uh, preempt in any way. Uh, but of course, we've already had some form of expansion in that Bangladesh, Uruguay, and Egypt mm -hmm. as UAE are now members of the NDB, they are mm -hmm. shareholders within it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that already brings this five to nine. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let's see uh, what happens from there. Mm. All right, let's take it to our digital audience as we wait the president. Uh, as soon as he uh, gets to the lectern, as I said, we will uh, take him live. Uh, John, if you can unmute, goodbye. Let's get your comment, your question. Thank you so much. Um, my question is uh, to the panel uh, is um, one that we often hear a lot about, uh, the relationship between uh, BRICS and Africa uh, and the potential of the Africa continental free trade area uh, when trading with BRICS. If uh, we could perhaps get a little bit of a comment uh, from, from the panel. Mm. All right, uh, Minister, maybe you can take it uh, with regards to, uh, and just to add on to John's question, what do you think African countries will see as a win or a successful BRICS conference from their point of view? Well, I think uh, a major win would be if all the uh, other four countries agree uh, that we will collaborate in advancing the practical imp implementation of the African continental free trade area primarily through providing support for the development of the logistics that are necessary for a free trade area to become uh, operational, as well as through uh, supporting uh, the African countries uh, jointly mm -hmm. through the African Union uh, to give effect to the AFCFTA. Right. I think if we can agree on that, and then of course that agreement means the nature of cooperation mm. between the BRICS countries and the continent has to change because to trade intra-Africa, we have to produce on the continent. Mm. Mm. So it means we're not importing from the BRICS countries, we're establishing businesses in Africa right. so that when we label the product made in Africa, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it actually was made on the continent. Yeah. We improve our manufacturing capacity, we support industrialization on the continent. So it's a different order uh, of trade relationship. Yeah. If we can get that agreed, I believe this would be an immense contribution right. to Africa's development. And it's something that uh, your report in 2017 touched on. Yeah, we've actually done extensive modeling about what different sectors uh, would contribute to Africa's development. We've done it at an individual African mm. country for each of Africa's 54 countries across eight sectors, ranging from education to the full implementation of a continental free trade area. And over long term horizons, I'm talking about the next uh, decade mm -hmm. plus, mm -hmm. The full implementation of the continental free trade area has the largest impact on reducing extreme poverty and increasing GDP per capita. It is even better than a leapfrogging mm. and better than a manufacturing transition. Because if we, the way to increase the value add of our content is first to trade with ourselves and then to become, become, go up that value ladder and then become part of global uh, trading uh, uh, networks and platforms because Africa is not part mm. of the, the global uh, trading world. We, we are isolated and insulated from mm. one another. Something like 15-16% of our trade is with one another. Mm. In Europe it's 60%. Uh, so getting intra-Africa trade going, it will be painful but it is mm -hmm. the, the surest way of moving forward. The reason why China and India, the US and the, and the EU yeah. do well is because they have large internal markets. Yeah. We can only get that by the African continental free trade area. Right. All right. Uh, as we await the president, uh, let's uh, take it back to the digital audience. And my apologies in advance if I have to cut you uh, to go and take that uh, address live. Uh, Tembaleto, let's hear from you. Um, thank you very much and good evening to the audience and good evening to the minister and the doc as well. Um, mine, I'll try to pack this question very shortly, but it's more of a comment as well as a question of how, how minister, do we ensure that, and I'm, I'm speaking biasly from, from someone who's from Nelson Mandela Bay, how do we biasly ensure that such a massive catalytic investment that, that is brought about the BRICS um, Development Bank 
um, as well as such huge commitment towards development? How do we localize it and ensure that we're able to catalyze um, such, such relations at a local municipal level through an advanced sister cities program that we can use to roll out throughout our local municipalities? We know that there's a lot of work done in China through the rural development strategy um, as well as um, countries like Russia. So how do we ensure that I know that the department is busy with this roadshow and is trying to ensure that we're able to ensure that BRICS is going out to, to every citizen in every corner. But how do you ensure that at a, at a local government level, we're able to capitalize on, on, on these relations that are, that are forged by BRICS and ensure that we're able to harness development at a local municipal level through these relations that are, that are, that are, that are nurtured by national government as well as the BRICS formation? Mm -hmm. Uh, Minister, top down as well as down up, I think it's important. Yeah. I, I think uh, what I'm really hearing is we need to do much more outreach mm, mm. than we're doing on BRICS because we're doing all of what uh, the gentleman referred to. Uh, the uh, projects that are supported through the New Development Bank are going to be implemented at the local level and perhaps we need to go out to those local communities and say this particular water project is funded through the BRICS Bank. Uh, this road infrastructure is funded through the BRICS Bank. And of course, to implement, we must work closely with local government. That's why within BRICS, we have a local government forum as well. Mm -hmm. So I see the need for more information uh, uh, to be provided uh, by DERCO and other departments. And we should continue the outreach that mm -hmm. we began uh, this year during our chairship of, of BRICS right. and ensure that we do reach out, provide information and actually give a name mm -hmm. to the various projects to the value of over three billion uh, that are now to be funded by the NDB. Right. Uh, Dr. Salias, the benefits of having the new development bank? I think there's a lot that South Africa can do with regard to improving its, its investment climate. You know what? Um, uh, I, a little bit of a tangential to, to the question you're asking because I listened to the minister and uh, she's make, making the point, which we all know, that um, South Africa's growth and development is primarily our responsibility. Nobody else is going to come and develop and grow us. And we have just a host of impediments uh, amongst skilled migration, which we consider foreigners mm. to be enemies both at, an, uh, at every level. Mm. It, it is a huge impediment. Uh, and we uh, have a, we, we're not creating an entrepreneurial economy. We are not uh, empowering people um, from the bottom up. We, we just have so many challenges in the country that we can resolve ourselves you know, within our uh, ambit to resolve. And there, mm. I think, much more work that should be done as opposed to looking towards the either the uh, uh, any of the banks, mm. whether it's the IMF, the World Bank, or the uh, New Development Bank, because they, they will fund specific infrastructure, capital intensive projects that are important, right. very important, uh, particularly to get the um, uh, communication and infrastructure pipelines going within mm, Africa. Mm. But uh, many of the other things uh, are really within our domestic political and economic policy framework that I think requires requires more attention right. and leadership than what it's getting at the moment. Right. Let's take it back to our digital audience. Sepang, to you, if you can unmute, let's get your question and comment. All right, Sepang, can you hear us? All right, it seems that we're having a bit of an issue with Sepang. Let's hear from Delhi. Delhi, if you can unmute, give us your comment, your question for our guests. Good evening, everybody. Good, good evening to the minister and everybody on the panel. I think my concern is that we have a huge energy crisis in the country. And to have a growing economy, we have to have a country that's functional. How is BRICS going to assist us in dealing with our energy crisis? All right, straight, yeah, straight to the point. We'll get the minister's take in a short while. Let's hear from Bongane Morris. Thank you so much. Uh, without preempting what is going to be discussed in the summit, uh, I, I just wanted to know, does uh, the countries that have been allowed to join the national, uh, the new development bank uh, automatically going to be part of the BRICS? And if so, uh, is the criteria that is available uh, that has been developed going to highlight the character of countries that are going to be allowed uh, on BRICS uh, in particular? Is the 
draft a policy that the BRICS has already developed, highlighting as to who exactly can develop with what values and all of that, or is it open in terms of diverse uh, interests? Mm. Uh, that is my question. Thank you. I'm, just, I'm not sure if you're going to be jumping the gun in terms of talking about that, but uh, I, I guess uh, Mongan is uh, trying to understand the, the, the criteria and the procedure in terms of choosing these countries. Can you yeah. enlighten us on that? There aren't criteria at, pr at present. The first time we had extensive discussions on expansion of BRICS was last year under the chair of China, China and it was agreed that a set of guidelines should be developed. This is what South Africa has been working on uh, during this year. That uh, draft document will be submitted to the heads of state and it is their decision as to whether they accept what we have proposed or uh, change it uh, uh, in fundamental ways. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, how they are going to respond mm -hmm. uh, to what we have put to them. Uh, once uh, they've uh, affirmed it, which I hope they do, yeah. um, we would then be able to be you know, much more open mm -hmm. uh, about what the contents of that document uh, are. So there isn't an expansion at present. I was referring to membership of the NDB mm -hmm. and all uh, uh, those who've joined the NDB have indicated an interest in an expanded uh, BRICS. And it would seem to me odd that they would be, uh, you know, welcomed mm. as uh, shareholders in the bank, and but not welcomed mm -hmm. as BRICS uh, for uh, members. So we'll see right. uh, uh, what eventually ensues. And mm. it is the leaders who mm. will make uh, those right. decisions. As to uh, energy, as I indicated earlier, uh, our Minister of Electricity is working very closely with the BRICS countries, particularly with China and India, right. on uh, solutions to our energy crisis. There are uh, aspects of uh, technology transfer uh, that are being discussed uh, with China. And the Minister of okay. uh, Electricity, as far as right. I recall, spoke of this a few days ago. Minister, sorry to catch you. I just understand the President is at the lectern. Let's listen in. Fellow South Africans, I'd like to address you this evening on the visits that we are going to have in relation to BRICS this week, but more particularly on South Africa's foreign policy in the light of our country being the host of the 15th BRICS Summit. I would also like to get us to understand and appreciate the significance of this gathering for our country and for the African continent. A day ahead of the visit of the BRICS members and others, we will receive President Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China, on his fourth state visit to South Africa. This BRICS summit and the state visit by President Xi Jinping, as well as the many bilateral meetings and engagements we will have with President Lula da Silva of Brazil, with Prime Minister Modi of India, and many other heads of state on the sidelines of the summit, have a bearing on our relationships with other countries and South Africa's place in the world. To understand why these relations are so important for our country and its people, we need to understand the principles and the values that shape our foreign policy and also inform our international relations. Before the dawn of democracy in 1994, the apartheid South African state was a pariah in the international community, condemned for committing a crime against humanity. The foreign policy of apartheid South Africa was defined by coercion, destabilization and military aggression. Since the advent of democracy, 
South Africa's foreign policy has been based on what our forebears inscribed in the Freedom Charter in 1955 when they declared that South Africa shall be a fully independent state which respects the rights and the sovereignty of all nations. South Africa, they continue to say, shall strive to maintain world peace and the settlement of all international disputes by negotiation, not war. This foreign policy approach is also a product of the efforts of leaders such as the late Oliver Reginald Tambo, who mounted a vigorous worldwide campaign to secure global support for our just struggle against apartheid. This put South Africa on the global map in relation to the interests of its people while the world condemned its apartheid rulers. Indeed, our foreign policy is a matter that is vital to our progress as a nation. Through stronger relations with other countries, manifested through investment and trade relations, we are able to grow our economy, create more opportunities for new businesses and create jobs. South Africa's foreign policy aims to promote our national interests based on the protection and promotion of our national sovereignty and constitutional order. It is also aimed at improving the well-being, the safety and the prosperity of our citizens and the achievement of a better Africa and a better world. The key pillars of our foreign policy include the promotion of human rights, peace and stability, and the strengthening of trade and investment ties with other countries. This foreign policy stance that we have taken since the advent of democracy has positioned South Africa as a reliable and influential partner on our continent and in the world. This has enabled our country to have friendly and valuable relations with countries around the world at political, diplomatic, trade, investment, sporting, social and many other levels. It is these principles that guide our participation in BRICS. Together with the members of BRICS, they being Brazil, Russia, India, China and ourselves, South Africa, BRICS makes up a quarter of the global economy. It accounts for a fifth of global trade and is home to more than 40% of the world's population. BRICS as a formation plays an important role in the world due to its economic power its market potential, its political influence and development cooperation. Yet the value of BRICS extends beyond its sheer size. BRICS continues, or countries rather, can collectively shape global dynamics and acting together, it has the potential to drive significant changes in the world economy and in international relations. Together, the BRICS members have used their collective voice to call for a world that is more equitable, balanced and governed by an inclusive system of global governance. Being a BRICS member has created positive opportunities for our country, South Africa. It has enabled our economy to have a strategic relationship with China, the second biggest economy in the world. Based on the strategic relationship between South Africa and the People's Republic of China, we will be signing several agreements during President Xi Jinping's state visit to our country. We have steadily strengthened trade and investment ties with other BRICS countries alongside collaboration in areas like development, skills, technology, security and innovation. South Africa has benefited from the New Development Bank, which was established by BRICS countries in 2015. 
our country has been funded by the bank in several infrastructure projects to the value of 100 billion rand in sectors such as roads, water, energy and transportation as well. South Africa has always championed the interests of Africa within BRICS. To further advance the African development agenda, more than 30 heads of state and government from across our continent will be attending the summit at our invitation. We want to build a partnership between BRICS and Africa so that our continent can unlock opportunities for increased trade, investment and infrastructure development. There are great opportunities for other BRICS countries to participate in the African continental free trade area by locating production and services in various countries on our continent, including our own, by partnering with local companies and local entrepreneurs. The 15th BRICS Summit will discuss a number of issues, including the important issue of the possible expansion of the membership of BRICS. More than 20 countries from around the world have formally applied to join BRICS and several others have expressed an interest in becoming part of the BRICS family. South Africa supports the expansion of the membership of BRICS. The value of BRICS extends beyond the interests of its current members. For its efforts to be effective, BRICS needs to build partnerships with other countries that share its aspirations and perspectives. An expanded BRICS will represent a diverse group of nations with different political systems that share a common desire to have a more balanced global order. In addition to other African leaders in attendance, we will also be welcoming leaders from several countries of the Global South whom we have invited. These include countries from the Caribbean and South America, from the Middle East, from West Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia as well. This BRICS summit is particularly important as it is being held as the world is confronted by fundamental challenges that are bound to determine the course of international events for years to come. Our world has become increasingly complex and fractured as it is increasingly polarized and competing with each other in various competing camps. Multilateralism is being replaced by the actions of different power blocks all of which we trade with, we invest with, and whose technology we also use. It is for this reason that South Africa continues to advocate for an open and rules-based global governance, trade, financial and investment system. It must be a system that does not depend on the exercise of power or unilateralism but by advancement of the interests of the peoples of the world. It is in this rules-based system that we seek to advance African prosperity and industrialization. We seek to change the rules to be fairer, but ultimately we want to promote an open system of economic and political relations. Amid all these challenges, Africa remains at the center of our foreign policy. We are firmly committed to strengthening the African Union so that it increases its capacity to support the achievement of greater integration on our continent. We are working towards the full implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area which is set to eliminate trade barriers, boost intra-African trade and achieve prosperity for all of Africa. 
It will also accelerate manufacturing and industrial capacity on our continent. The vibrant trading Africa we seek to build depends on Africa being stable and peaceful. For our continent Africa to thrive, we must silence the guns. We continue to work within the African Union to end several ongoing conflicts on the continent and restore constitutional and democratic government to countries that have recently experienced coups. South Africa is directly involved in a number of efforts to bring peace to Africa. We are currently involved in supporting the people of Mozambique and the Democratic Republic of Congo to ensure that there is peace and stability in their countries. The administration that I have the honor to lead has been devoted to attracting greater trade and investment into South Africa. Every visit we make to countries on our continent and across the world, and every visit by heads of state from other countries focuses on strengthening economic ties between our countries, country and those countries. For a foreign leader, as they visit our country, they are usually accompanied by a business delegation. We usually take a business delegations as well when we travel to other countries. The business forums that are held during these visits result in greater trade and greater investment and business partnerships and opportunities. To further strengthen economic ties between African countries and the United States of America, South Africa is inviting more than 30 African trade ministers and senior U.S. administration and congressional representatives to the next forum of the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, which is scheduled for November this year. As part of our ongoing relationship with countries of the, Afri of the European Union, we will hold the European Union South Africa Summit later this year in South Africa to foster our investment and trade relations. Recent trade statistics indicate the success of all our international links. Within the first three months of this year, we exported 450 billion worth of goods in mining, manufacturing, and agricultural sectors. Our biggest exports were to China, followed by the United States, Germany, Japan, and then India. Exports to other African countries account for around a quarter of the value of all our exports. Our tourism industry is recovering well from the effects of COVID-19. More than four million tourist arrivals were recorded in the first half of this year almost twice as many arrivals as in the same period last year. Companies across the globe have established new or expanded ventures in our country in sectors as diverse as energy, mining, vehicle production, the creative sector, manufacturing, and many other sectors. For every rand we attract, jobs are created and sustained. Our country is committed to a policy of non-alignment. We have resisted pressure to align ourselves with any one of the global powers or with influential blocks of nations. During the Cold War, the stability and sovereignty of many African countries was undermined because of their alignment with major powers. This experience has convinced us of the need to seek strategic partnership with other countries rather than be dominated by any other country. 
While some of our detractors prefer overt support for their political and ideological choices, we will not be drawn into a contest between global powers. Instead, our country strives to work with all countries for global peace and development. It is for this reason that South Africa is a member of the Non-Aligned Movement, a forum of some 120 countries that are not formally aligned with or against any major power bloc. Our decision not to align with any one of the global powers does not mean that we are neutral on matters of principle and national interest. Our non-aligned position exists alongside our active support for the struggles of the oppressed and marginalized people in different parts of the world. We have always believed that the freedom that we won and the international solidarity from which we benefited immensely imposes a duty on us to support the struggles of those who continue to experience colonialism and racial oppression. That is why we will continue to support the struggles of the people of Palestine and Western Sahara. We are fully committed to the Articles of the United Nations Charter, including the principle that all members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means. More recently, we participated in the African Peace Initiative to seek peace in the Ukraine and Russia conflict. Through this African Peace Initiative, our country continues to be involved in processes to ensure that the children who were removed from their homes in Ukraine are returned to their families and that the prisoners of war on both sides are exchanged. We continue to be involved in the talks regarding the reopening of the Black Sea to facilitate the flow of grain to the world markets. We firmly believe that dialogue, mediation and diplomacy is the only viable path to end the current conflict and achieve a durable peace. We support the principle of respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of all states and peoples. In the midst of the grave challenges facing humanity, we are determined that a reformed and representative United Nations must be at the center of global affairs. Our support for the UN exists alongside our firm belief that this premier multilateral institution needs genuine reform to make it more democratic, more representative and efficient. The UN Security Council must be transformed into a more inclusive, more effective body that is able to ensure peace and security. We are very pleased that the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, will be attending the BRICS Summit at our invitation. South Africa, as a member of the Community of Nations, will continue to play a constructive role in world affairs. In 2025, South Africa will assume the presidency of the G20 Group of Nations. This will be the first time that the G20 meetings are held and hosted in Africa. The G20 summit in 2025 will be an opportunity for South Africa to take a lead on critical challenges facing the global community. South Africa's approach to foreign relations is to seek increased collaboration, to secure greater trade opportunities and increased investment, and to work closely with partners across the globe to entrench peace and democracy and prosperity. As we continue to define our place as South Africa in the world, 
as we advance the needs of our people, we will continue to mobilize all moral, political and economic strength on the side of peace and development for all of humanity. We will continue our efforts to give effect to the call of the Freedom Charter that there shall be peace and friendship. As the week begins tomorrow, the streets of our country will be hubs of activity as visitors from various countries and nations will be our guests. Let us welcome them and give them the warmth and hospitality that we are known for. A number of those people may choose to stay for a few days beyond the summit to visit various beautiful parts of our country. And I call on all of us to show them the very best of South African Ubuntu as they go around our country. I thank you all. God bless South Africa. Gosi Sikelele i Africa. Mudzimu Ushudupadze Africa Chipembe. Thank you. Right, President Cyril Ramaphosa, they live from the capital, outlining South Africa's foreign policy, its objectives, as well as how it ties in with regards to the BRICS summit that's starting on Tuesday until Thursday. Remember, tomorrow uh, the Chinese president will be landing on our shores. I understand it's around 11 p.m. and the state visit taking place on Tuesday. SABC News International Foreign Editor uh, Sophie Mokwena is here with us as well. We're going to get her take in a short while, but just a very first. First, to, to you, Minister, uh, the President outlining the importance in terms of the relationships with BRICS, the principles that shape our foreign policy, also something that jumps out in terms of settling out the disputes through dialogue, not war. And that's become a contentious issue, especially with regards to the non-aligned stance that South Africa has taken. And the pushback that you get <coughs> from certain quarters. Why do you think the South Africa stance is so misunderstood? Well, you know, it, it uh, I think relates to this practice we've had in the world that we tell each other what to do. Um, I believe that the position we've taken of non-alignment has been extremely important. I saw it for myself uh, in that we were able to go to Ukraine and have excellent meetings with the Ukrainian leadership and other stakeholders and proceed from there to Russia and similarly have very open, very frank uh, discussions and agree that we will continue to work with both countries to seek peace. We mm. even uh, had <coughs> messages conveyed from one leader to the other by us as the peace delegation. So um, there aren't many leaders that can do that today. Mm. They can either speak to President Zelensky or some may be able to speak to President Putin, mm -hmm. but <coughs> unlike us, they can't be in both capitals. Right. And this is the value of the position uh, that uh, we have adopted. And I may say that uh, we actually enjoy support from mm. a large part of the world yeah. in the approach that we've taken because President Ramaphosa and the other six uh, uh, leaders have been in contact with almost every other right. world leader to inform them of the deliberations and the processes right. we've set in motion. The president also spoke uh, about the benefits of BRICS and I must just uh, mention and just the apologies we had some technical issues at the be beginning which delayed the president's address so apologies for that. Um, Dr. Siliers with regards to the president touched on the issue of the children who were removed from the Ukraine um, and strides that have been made to return them. How big of a boost will that be for South Africa if they had to get that past the post? Well, it's a very careful and nuanced way, together with the remarks about territorial integrity, mm. uh, to bring the issue to the table. Because let's face it, this war can end tomorrow. Russia invaded Ukraine. It attacks civilians. It threatens the use of nuclear weapons and does these three things as a member of the G of the P permanent as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. So South Africa walks a fine balancing mm. act and I think as the ministers indicate minister indicated, I think I was about the only analyst that wrote that the peace mission was in actual fact uh, largely a success mm. for the reasons that she mentioned. Um, South Africa and Africa 
is taken seriously in this peace process, which, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, uh, I think we would have thought uh, unimaginable. So for me, the children issue, it, it, it represents other things. It is important, but it, it represents the broader challenge, which if you are t trying this delicate uh, walking on eggs that South Africa mm -hmm. and the Africans, other Africans are trying to do, you need to be careful, and I think we are uh, doing that. I think at the start of this whole issue around, I mentioned that Lady, Lady R and so on, I think Russia instrumentalized us, mm. um, and, and I think we've recovered our footing a little bit, mm. uh, and I think the BRICS summit therefore um, reflects also, again, and the G20 summit and everything else that has happened, the importance of South Africa, and the President was careful to reach out to, to the US, to reach out to the EU and to make it clear mm -hmm. uh, that uh, this is not a them versus us kind of situation. Right. Uh, Sophie Mokwena, South Africa will be welcoming all the leaders but one, uh, Vladimir Putin, not in the country, represented by Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. How much of an impact will that have on the summit on its own? I was reading in the Sunday Times, they did an interview with, uh, with the Brazilian president saying that he would have liked to have a face one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, with the uh, Russian president. Your take? Well, I think I agree with President Lula because this could have presented an opportunity for members of BRICS to engage President Vladimir Putin one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, on the current global challenge, the war in Ukraine. But unfortunately, it cannot happen because South Africa is the signatory to the Rome Statute. We didn't only sign, but we domesticated the laws and therefore South Africa would have acted in a very irresponsible manner if they had violated those uh, statutes and the laws. You would recall what happened with uh, uh, President uh, Omar al-Bashir then mm. and the courts in South Africa uh, making a terrible finding against the country. And therefore, as the president pointed out, that uh, almost in violation of the four bears mm -hmm. of this foreign policy who spoke about engagement and peace mm -hmm. and therefore but i think not all is lost because he is going to participate yeah. virtually and tomorrow the arrival of the foreign affairs minister uh, minister sergey lavrov and i think the minister can attest to that the meeting tomorrow morning of foreign affairs minister so you still have an opportunity to talk about a range of issues but of course uh, people many felt that it's not fair for yeah. president putin but there's nothing that we can do. We have to respect the laws of the country. We have uh, domesticated the Rome Statute. Yeah. Uh, speaking about opportunities, uh, the president did touch on South Africa being part of multilateral uh, forums, assuming the presidency of the G20 in 2025 major. Um, in order to push forward, I guess, South Africa's agenda. Big takeaways for you with regards to that, Sophie. Yes, uh, you know that uh, the president will be going to India, the G20 summit. The president has been pushing to ensure that uh, the continent has a seat within the G20, the same way you have the European Union. Mm -hmm. And I think us hosting the G20 in 2025 will present South Africa with a better platform as we are doing now with BRICS to push some of the important global matters. And I think that uh, is a good thing, but also it does show that uh, South Africa has got an important role to play in terms of the global stage. And you know, as the, pre the president pointed out, the UN Secretary General, yeah. uh, Antonio Guterres, is coming. And I'm told his focus will be on the transformation of the multilateral institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the Security Council, so that you can have this just world. And I think us hosting the international community is a plus, including AGOA. It mm -hmm. is important to engage the Americans. And the fact that the Americans didn't move this uh, uh, gathering 
as people were hoping that uh, Americans will not agree to come to our shores based on all these challenges, it's a good sign that South Africa will continue to be a global player. But as we do that, that must benefit the ordinary mm. people in South Africa, in the region, SADC, and of course on the continent. South Africa is not an All island. Right. We're going to take it uh, to our digital audience uh, in a short while to get their take. Uh, but Minister, let me just bring you in with regards to the value of BRICS. The president did say the value of BRICS goes beyond its sheer size. But as to Sophie's point, how, do you, how does that translate to actual benefit on the ground for ordinary citizens? Mm -hmm. I think we've spoken about some of the benefits. Um, certainly being able to establish the new development bank was important, right. but also strengthening trade relations. And uh, we have a number of working groups uh, in the science and innovation space, looking at matters of vaccines and looking at other uh, responses to health uh, pandemics mm. and other challenges um, that may confront us as South Africa, but the broadly uh, the developing world. So there are a number of benefits. Our young people have access to universities mm. in the BRICS countries and are training uh, at very uh, scarce discipline uh, uh, levels in a number uh, of institutions. And I think that's really fantastic uh, for South Africa. We also are growing our telecommunication space, uh, seeing a great deal of modernization of much of our technology, and we're doing this mm -hmm. together. We are um, working together to craft an approach toward enhanced cybersecurity and sharing lessons mm -hmm. and experiences. So um, I think the benefits are just you know, right. uh, immense, and I you know, hesitate uh, to again reiterate mm -hmm. The fact of trade is extremely important. The more agricultural workers that have jobs yes. is due to the kinds of relationships uh, that we've established. Right. The more automotive workers uh, making components yeah. for the automotive sector relates very much to the relationships uh, we've established. So uh, some uh, may feel the impact because they work in a bus mm. making plant uh, in Kabecha. Uh, others may not directly feel the impact, but the fact that uh, our revenues are able to generate right. a social security net uh, is an important fact that we should recognize. Right. So, you know, the, the, the benefits are it's many. Uh, let's take it to our digital audience, get reaction now to the president's uh, address. Sheldon, to you. <coughs> yes, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my point is just on the inconsistent political systems that we are going to face. Uh, uh, the diversity of political systems and ideologies within the expansion of the BRICS could create tension, as we know, and challenges in finding consensus on international issues. This could potentially strain South Africa's diplomatic efforts, as we know. So how do we, as South Africa, address this issue? Uh, maybe, Minister, you can answer that question for me. Sheldon, thank you very much indeed. In Tatua, let's hear from you, your reaction to the President's uh, address, if you can unmute. Um, the President touched on uh, local businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, the question is, we know that um, international trade affects uh, small businesses in general. How is South Africa going to protect these small, image, small businesses, mm -hmm. local small businesses? Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Let's uh, hear from Kustas. Yes, um, th thank you very much. I think that this briefing um, highlights a couple of things. I've heard the president before speak about the need to reform the United Nations. Mm. Um, but I don't see any movement there. It's over a year now he's been speaking about this, um, trying to get to reform the United Nations. Now, my question at the same time, I just want to add a bit more. When the president speak about the, the development bank that has poured over 100 billion rands of funding into the country, which is South Africa, I don't see this 100 billion. He says it's in the energy, in the water, in the transport. I look around, I see a water sector is collapsing. I look at the energy that is just not working, transport system that is just not up to scratch. How could we, as a people, 
make, make meet up with him mm. because he speaks of our heads. We look around, we don't see. He speaks big numbers, and we don't see anything. And we want to believe him, but we don't see the number that he's talked about. We took in China 20, ten billion dollars mm. in 2018. Where is it? That's my question. So measurable and tangible uh, is important. Delhi, let's just hear from you. If you can unmute. Delhi? Yes, I'm here. Um, yes, I think it's important for us to see tangible results, um, especially with uh, the fact that we already have so many internal problems within our country. <laughs> so we'd like to see um, what is going to happen, you know, with uh, obviously um, this uh, expansion of BRICS as well. Uh, I also believe that um, it will cause a lot of tension um with with um you know different types of of opinions and and beliefs and values from different types of countries so um we we want to see what is going to happen and what the plan is uh for our internal issues as well because i think we're facing a lot of unemployment issues we're facing a lot of energy issues and yeah. uh we just don't want an extension of a problem after a problem right Delhi, thank you very much indeed. We fast run out of time, but last word to you, Dr. Salis, 30 seconds. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think this issue of the values that, uh, in, uh, for example, between China and the other countries is a big issue. Yeah. It's going to come. UN Security Council, Africa's got the Isloweni consensus position, but uh, this is going to require much more than what uh, the, uh, the, the current, particularly the West, is prepared to put on the table. The third, I think the most yeah. important challenge that we face is that South Africa is steadily de-industrializing. Mm. Despite BRICS, despite all the efforts, we really need to change our right. game. This is, uh, we're not going anywhere at the moment. Mm. And uh, that is all related to domestic, to issues of leadership, right. accountability, and to, to action. Right. Dr. Salias, Minister, thank you very much indeed for your time to our digital audience as well also to SABC International Editor Sophie McKenna. Her team is going to be very busy over the next week or so, so you can rely on SABC to bring you full coverage of the BRICS Summit. Before we go, here's my take. I was in Shanghai back in 2014 when news broke that the city will host the headquarters of the BRICS Development Bank and I witnessed firsthand the, the buzz, the optimism for the block of leading emerging economies that can make a difference in people's lives, ordinary citizens. And at the time, uh, I chatted to Thabo Tache, uh, then South African Council General in Shanghai, who expressed excitement, especially about the deepening of bilateral relations with countries like China. So there was hope. Let's reflect, a couple of questions. To what extent has the world's economic center of gravity shifted over the last decade or so, from the North to the developing South? And looking forward, if BRICS expands, Will it result in a more equitable world order? This grouping has been described as a trade and a collaboration block. Others say it's an it's a influential global multilateral platform. But there's a fundamental question that lies in the heart of this formation. How can BRICS better the lives of its citizens? The visibility of BRICS on a global stage needs to translate into a clearer vision and improve development at a local level. What do I mean? BRICS needs to better boost development for you and me, right? Again, it needs to better the lives of its citizens. Leave the big words to one side, multilateralism, philosophies, modalities. Let's break it down brick by brick, as I say. If this block can't build on and improve the quality of life of its country citizens, then what's the use? Tangible benefits for you and your community, quantifiable and measurable. That's, that's important, and that's my take. If you miss anything, be sure to watch this episode of It's Topical on YouTube. The Late Edition picks up coverage next. If you're watching a repeat of this program, then, as always, the news continues. Until next week, take care. Bye-bye.